Welcome to Systems Engineering Leadership, Week 4. This week we'll continue giving you additional tools for your course objectives by focusing on change approaches that you can include in your leadership model. As you remember, we're using the Leadership Commandments. In the past three weeks, we focused on the First and Second Commandments about knowing thyself and knowing others. This week, however, we're transitioning into initiating and sustaining change as part of the model. We're also using the Atom model. The past three weeks, we've talked about analysis and design. We will continue to provide that for you in this lesson. However, we're going to add a third area of acting, which will give you proven tools uh, to implement strategic design for change. For this week, we will have five topics that we'll cover. First, about the importance of change. Second, about what are the driving factors and the barriers to implementing change. The third is understanding different types of change. Fourth, evaluating the change readiness of your organization. And last but not least, models to assess and implement the change. So why is change important? And this is pulled from the book down here, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, from uh, David Harold and Donald Fidor. Uh, the change, the way you lead change. So in 19 or in 2008, the survey of more than 750 top CEOs, which was conducted by IBM, 65% said that they had planned uh, change for their organization uh, radically in the last two years. However, astonishingly, 80% um, admitted that their organizations hadn't been successful in managing the change in the past. So we've done this forever. However, organizations continue to be uh, ineffective at it. Now, what are some of the reasons uh, for change uh, uh, that might be held in an organization which would keep you from being successful with the change? Well, Deloitte and Touche had done a survey of the chief information officers, and I found that this particular study was uh, telling in the, the 10 reasons or the barriers for success to change. The first three were particularly important, and the first one, which is the resistance to change, from my experience, typically is the most severe. And as you can see, that 82% of the uh, CIOs interviewed said that that was the reason that uh, change had failed or it was a barrier to change. The second one was, which was 72% was inadequate sponsorship, so they didn't have the right people bought in. And the third one, which also I'm sure you can resonate with, uh, which 65% of the CIOs said this was unrealistic expectations of management. The next areas were poor project management and the case for ch change just wasn't compelling that there wasn't provided uh, sufficient reasoning from management. Okay, and as you can see, the areas in orange are directly related to managing the organizational change. But additional reasons uh, that uh, were barriers were the scope expansion or uncertainty, uh, poor leadership or uh, any type of uh, project management skills. Uh, there wasn't any change program in place. Uh, no horizontal process view, so that they couldn't see this across the organizations. Uh, and particularly since this was uh, IT related, that the IT perspective was not integrated. However, today we are going to focus on these top three, which is the resistance, the sponsorship, and unrealistic expectations. So what are the factors that drive change? Let's talk about four factors. The first is uh, significant change in technology. 
second would be is the world economy. I'm sure you pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the world financially and that you can see that there are significant turmoil uh, which is driving uh, different changes towards new products or away from products or changing the economy of different countries which ultimately has some effect uh, on us here in the US as well as many other countries uh, throughout the world such as the Eurozone or, or Asia. The third area which is the whole globalization. This is moving to more of a homogeneous society where work is done uh, throughout the world and uh, with the use of technology it makes it easier to integrate uh, different countries as well as different cultures uh, and uh, distribute the work throughout the geographic dispersion around the world. And finally the competition. As the internet has become more pervasive, as things are getting cheaper, as labor becomes more available, competition and staying on top of uh, your success in an organization uh, is even more reason to pay attention to change. Now, two items to remember as we progress through this lecture. First, that organizational change is necessary for the organization to remain viable. Uh, if you're not going to change, eventually things are going to change for you or to you. And the last item is that one variable that we can always count on as a content, constant is that change itself uh, is that is going to be constant throughout uh, our lifetimes and the frequency and intensity of this is only going to increase. Now let's talk about three types of change and for this we're going to do an activity to see if you're paying attention and hopefully get you a little bit interactive with this lecture. Let's talk about three types of change and for this we're going to give you an activity as we go through here to try to make this a little bit interactive. The first type of change is developmental change. This is where you're improving something, you're working on some standards, it's relatively simple, uh, generally low pain. As an example, when I was working uh, in the semiconductor industry, modifying things within the fabrication factories for the chips, uh, this might include something like adding new tools or just changing a process slightly to become more efficient for chip manufacturing. The second type of change would be known as a transitional change. Now this is to fix a problem or to work on certain criteria. It's generally more complex and it's different than just doing developmental change. Uh, an example of this might be a transition from moving from people doing work on a certain portion of the process to having a machine do that. And the third type of change is transformational change. And this is usually apparent or needed when survival is important, uh, something emergent is happening, or there's a significant cultural shift necessary. And as an example, in the fab or the fabricating plant, uh, we would have the need or came up with an idea to move from chemical etching of the chips to using light. Okay, and that was that was a significant change of the way we had done. It wasn't just trend transitional, it was a major shift in the way we looked at uh, engineering design and manufacture. So as an example, let's take a look at Apple. So I'm going to give you three types of changes, A, B, and C. To, the first change would be to move from computers to a music system solutions. Second type of change would be to move from Motorola to Intel processors and the third would be the introduction of a new iPad from the current iPad. So I'll ask you to pause this momentarily and see if you can draw lines between the three types of change to match them with the three examples I gave you from Apple. Let's see how well you did. The developmental change 
uh, improvement standards, simple low pain is just the introduction of a new product. Maybe it's a little bit faster, maybe a little cheaper, ha has some new bells and whistles. Um, the transitional change would be uh, a little bit more complex, moving from a RISC processor to what is known as a CISC processor, where we, they move from Motorola uh, or IBM chips to Intel processors. Uh, that process itself was almost a year to do the transition and now all Apple uh, computers and laptops use Intel processors. And the third, as you can figure out, the transformational change is uh, Apple bringing in iTunes and moving from strictly being a computer hardware and software maker to now being more of a supplier uh, for entertainment and music. Developmental change is also known as adaptive change. Transitional change is sometimes called innovative change. And transformational change is known as radical change. And we'll use those terms throughout the course. Now, the next section, we're going to talk about phases of transition and phases of change. And I use the word change and transition uh, interspersed. It's not that people fear change so much, but they fear the transition of moving from one place to another. So let's talk about phases of transition and phases of change. And this, this particularly is adapted from the human aspects of mergers and acquisitions by some of my colleagues, Georgia Gunther, uh, Dennis Jaffe, Cynthia Scott, and all of this is based on some original terminology and work done by the gentleman by the name of Bill Bridges. So the four phases of change or transition would be initially starting here, going left to right, uh, starting with the denial. So when a change happens, people will, will deny that it exists, that it doesn't exist or it doesn't pertain to me. That's more important, that this is happening to others. Okay, and during the denial phase, it's very difficult to communicate and allow people to think uh, constructively or rationally. As you move from denial down the curve, sometimes this is called the bathtub model, uh, moving towards the lower portion of the bathtub, you run into resistance. So once people say this does a, a, is pertinent to me, uh, they say, OK, it exists, but now I don't have to go along with the change. It may affect me but I can resist that. And the goal is to move people through quickly through denial and resistance. Okay, uh, This type of change, this is moving from the past or the something is ending. And now what happens is, is they move into the neutral zone. Okay, And the goal is to get them to move from resistance into exploration. Okay, If you can get them into exploration, this is where they begin discussing or thinking about options. So what if I go along with the change? What good can it, can it come, come to me? What's the advantages for me? Once you move them through exploration, you can get them into commitment. OK, now I know, OK, this is right. This is going to happen. There's some benefit, uh, and I'm OK with the change. And then from here, they, they move forward. OK, and that, this represents the future or new beginnings. So most of the activities up here are external, and many of the activities down here are more internal to the individual. So the goal here as a manager, as a leader, will be to get people to move through these, these phases. Now, here are the types of things, if you're trying to figure out where different people are uh, in the phases of transition or change, you can look for these type of modifiers moving from shock, anger, despair, to hope and joy. Now, let's talk about the behavioral types that you'll see when these types of transitions are present. First, you generally have the naysayers, where they are continually pushing back. And the th what will be important about the naysayers is to get them on board. So you have the naysayers. And then you have people who are the fence sitters, that they haven't decided 
which side that they are going to be uh, participating on. And then finally you have the early adopters. No matter what the change is, they're anxious to, to do the change, to start it, and if anyone is familiar with the Agile process, which is primarily used in software, you'll know that the Agile process talks about doing what's known as rapid prototyping, where you begin the change and then you make changes as, as necessary. You will have all of these types of behavioral types throughout your organization. The key is to find the early adopters okay, and have them help you uh, transition the fence sitters so that the fence sitters are moving in your direction. Okay? And then collectively, they can go after the naysayers. So it doesn't have to be all of, all of you. And as you pull everyone towards the right side of the curve, uh, you can make change happen and hopefully it can be less painful. All right, let's talk about your leadership change goal. As I mentioned earlier in this lecture, um, when leaders manage change poorly, what happens is uh, productivity, okay, this area in here, this is productivity, um, tends to to drop. Uh, so positive productivity is up here, uh, negative productivity is down, down here, and longer transition times uh, make it much more painful until they move to the acceptance zone, which is on the far right. Your goal as a manager and as a leader is to transition individuals as quickly as possible so that the, pro the productivity this area here and the adoption uh, is equally as great as what might have been experienced in the transition time uh, when you're moving through the different phases of change. One particular point, most managers want to move right from the left hand side to the right hand side and not address any of the resistance uh, that and denial that can be happening in this area. That is a drastic mis mistake because if that's ignored, what will happen is as you get into this area in the right hand side, which is acceptance, uh, if resistance had not been identified previously, it will come out and it will come out in a very inopportune time. Next activity, let's talk about the change readiness for a project that you have that you've done in the past, you may have working on currently, or that's planned. And this particular assessment tool is present in the materials for this week. What I would encourage you to do is to print out the tool and do an evaluation so that you can identify the change readiness, how ready is your organization uh, to do change. So as you can see, we're using the Atom model here, which is analyze, design, act, and measure. And I'll walk you through one of these evaluations. So in the analyze phase, uh, first of all, we'll talk about the metrics that we're using, which are up here on the, on the top. So we'll move from one to five, uh, one being strongly disagree, or we almost never do this. You can think in either way. Two being disagree, or 50% of the time we do this, or less than 50% of the time. Three is somewhat agree, about half of the time we do that. Four is agree, less um, than 50% 50, 50 of the time. Uh, and five is we strongly agree, almost all of the time. Uh, we do this. So that is your rating of your current environment. The second scale we'll talk about in a moment. So what we might see here is how do I, for the analyze phase, do I properly evaluate or does my organization properly evaluate the need for change? And if I said, well, I kind of disagree with that, we don't do that, um, it happens uh, less than 50% of the time, I would put a 2. Uh, and then I would ask the next question, how openly do they discuss change? Once again, this is in the analyze phase. They openly discuss it, but they probably don't, properly don't evaluate it. So I strongly agree, or almost all of the time. 
and then you'll continue down the questions to, to answer all of these. Once you have the questions answered in column one in the current environment, then I want you to evaluate the importance for that element of define change. Uh, as we talked about previously, about you disagree that proper evaluation is done for evaluating the need of change. So how important is that, even though it's done at a level two, how important is that? Well, you may say, you know what, I think that's, that's important, but uh, not extremely important or very important. I would say there's some level of importance to that. And we would ask you to do the same type of thing for all of the other elements. In interest of time, I won't go through each one of these. Once you have completed those two columns, we'd ask you to evaluate the potential success impact. So we know that organizations that do all of these phases well, that they have the higher probability for success. So we would just put these together. So we would call them, for example, the first one, which would be uh, a 2C. So we would say, we don't do it particularly well, and but the importance is uh, about medium for that. Then we ask you to do is look at these and evaluate which are the areas, which are the leveraged areas for change that you would want to have focus on. Now, obviously, item num this one, the item in design, 1A, that one comes, uh, jumps out, right? So here's something that this almost never happens, which is very common, proper resourcing for the change. That most management and leadership want to have change happen, but they don't give you the right resources. So there's not enough money, there's not enough people, uh, things are, are uh, not done in a timely manner. So, so that would be an area that you'd want to focus on because that's probably what is known as a gating factor. Now, you can look at these and the, the reason for the numbers and letters, the letters should tell you the level of importance and the numbers should tell you how well or how poorly this is, is being done. Another area that you might want to focus on uh, would be in the ACT set phase which is executes change successfully. Well, this says to me, this is um, extremely important, that's the A, and we do this almost all of the time. And the reason that you may want to keep that in front of you is you do it well, but you, and you may not need a lot of additional resources, but you've identified that as something critical for change to happen. So what we'd ask you to do once again is to look at an existing, uh, a previous project or a project that you're planning and do an evaluation so that you can bring this into a discussion question this week in class. And hopefully you can get uh, your instructor, myself, uh, or any of the other colleagues in the classroom to help work you through the analysis that you've done uh, to get, get ideas on how to make change stick. As we're closing out this lecture, I want to talk about uh, three different models for change. And you'll find some of this in your book, but once again, as I reminded you previously, that these lectures are designed to be supplemental uh, to the material in the book and also will reinforce some of the material. So let's talk about Kurt Lewin's three change model, which I've seen used extensively throughout industry. He has three phases here. One is called unfreezing, the second is actually changing, and the third is called refreezing. Now, unfreezing is this is where managers can uh, convince employees of the need to replace the old behaviors and beliefs. So you have to get people unstuck and get them bought in. The second is actually doing the change. This is providing new models, you provide mentors, you provide training, uh, maybe even benchmark information to get the change to happen. And then once things are up and running, then you need to refreeze that. You need to reinforce that the new behavior is what you want to do or the new systems are in, in place. And this is very simple uh, three-step model. 
we have a tendency, or I've seen a tendency for managers and leaders to try to skip the unfreezing and immediately move to the change or the refreeze. And if you don't get the buy-in, once again, as we go back to that curve, uh, you don't deal with some of the denial or resistance, it will come back. So spend the time up front to get you the change in the end. Now, using a source from Edgar Schein at MIT, uh, Edgar, Dr. Schein says, there are three levels of change that we should be aware of. This is the second model. This is where we have what he calls the iceberg model, where you have these artifacts or things that are observable. They're visible, but they're hard to decipher the meaning of. So you look for change, uh, and this is at what he would call the surface level. Now, as you know, with the iceberg, there, the areas under the water are the ones that are the most troublesome and the areas that you want to spend your time focusing on. The second area is what's known as shared or espoused values. These are strategies, goals, philosophies, um, justifications for what we do in an organization. And the deepest level is what's known as the common assumptions. These are kind of unconscious, taken for granted beliefs, the perceptions, the thoughts, things that aren't written down, the feelings of how we approach things. And the key will be is as you're developing change, you want to look for the artifacts, you want to reinforce the values, and you want to unearth or bring the common assumptions to the surface so that people can be in agreement. Now, let's go to the third and last model, uh, and this is Cotter's eight steps for leading change. This model has been around for some time. I've seen it used in industry. It's very uh, applicable, easy to use, uh, and generally very successful. So you first have the need, as Cotter defines it, John Cotter, to find the sense of urgency. The second is forming the powerful coalition. This is, as you remember from uh, the transition model, is this is getting the people on board. The third is creating a vision so that you know where you're going. And then you have to communicate the vision. You have to empower others to act on it. And you have to create short-term wins so that people can see the progress uh, is being made. This will help the resistance move much more uh, into exploration and acceptance. Finally, you have to consolidate the movements and maintain the momentum and then institutionalize the new approaches. Now, hopefully what you've recognized from the previous two models is there's some synergy here, right? So if we're talking about the atom model, you have the first three in a design phase, the second is in the act, and the third is in the measure phase. And if we go back to Lewin's model, uh, you can see that unfreezing happens in the first phase here where you look at the urgency, you get the coalitions together, and you create the vision. The change is where you begin communicating, you get others to act, you create the short-term wins, and then refreezing is this is consolidating everything and inst institutionalizing the new approaches. So I would encourage you to consider these models as you're developing your leadership model for the final, final paper. Okay, so next steps after you finish viewing this lecture. First, complete the change readiness assessment that we spoke about in the lecture. Next is complete the reading for the articles and the book reading. Certainly participate in this week's discussion. Obviously, you're going to need your change model, uh, the assessment for one of the discussion questions and then begin preparing your final notes for your behavioral styles paper and your final leadership model. So thanks for listening for, to the lecture. I hope you've gotten some value, valuable information from it.